here with Jeff Siegel, Jeffrey Siegel from jeffreysiegelwellness.com. Jeffrey has an amazing background that resonates with me so much. It's about the intersection of science and spirituality. I'll let Jeffrey tell you a little bit about his background in this topic matter. And then I'm just kind of giddy to ask him some questions about the intersection of the two. So Jeff, uh, how'd you get started on this, in this, in this journey? Yeah. You know, I, I think if you go back, you know, and, and kind of take a look at, at my life, um, and I could say that, you know, the seeds were planted really early in me to have this sort of appreciation for just like the inner life that we all have this like, you know, crazy emotional world, uh, inside. Um, and this, this started for me as a teenager in, in having an eating disorder and, uh, just like what I consider to be, you know, a severe mind body trauma, you know, my, my mind and my body were at war with each other. Um, and, you know, as a helpless sort of 14 year old, I, I was really struggling to, to make sense of it all, figure out what was going on, um, you know, and, and through a long process of, of, of healing and of inner work, um, you know, that I began to kind of slowly, slowly like climb myself out of that hole. And, uh, you know, and, and I was drawn to, to naturally kind of, I wanted to figure out like, what the hell happened to me, right? And, and you know, being raised in this very sort of scientific worldview, I was like, oh, maybe science has some answers for me. So I started digging into things like psychology and, and neuroscience and in undergraduate of college, that, that was sort of my focus was, was neuroscience and kind of behavioral biology. Um, and I felt like I got a really good understanding of, of the human sort of mind and body from this sort of like objective scientific perspective, but it also felt really reductionist. It felt like, you know, I was like, can we really just like boil everything down to neurotransmitter imbalances and like call it a day, right? Um, yeah, it feels so, meaningless. <laughs> yeah, you know, there, there's something, there was something else. Like I had this inkling, like there must be something more. So that was when I, I graduated college and, um, you know, and I was, I was looking for that something more. And then I felt like I needed to go on sort of my own hero's journey. So I actually left the U.S. I moved first to Malaysia where I lived for a year. And then I moved to Hong Kong where I lived for many years. Um, and part of me being over there was, was kind of immersing myself in more Eastern spiritual traditions and contemplative traditions. And especially I, I did a whole master's in Buddhist studies when I was um, in Hong Kong. Um, and I was really just looking for this sort of complement to this scientific worldview of like, and, and it seems um, that a lot of these, you know, ancient traditions had so much to say about, you know, why we do what we do. And, and this fundamental question of who are we, um, that could really help inform, you know, the, the soul searching that I was doing for myself, right. The seeking for my own growth and healing. Uh, that's amazing so then, for starters. I got it. <laughs> dude, your story is like identical to mine. It's crazy right now. I struggled with some food stuff in high school. I wrestled and uh, got out of control yeah. with eating and, and I went through the ups and downs. And then I was feeling meaningless, a sense of meaningless and maybe, I don't know, despair or something in college doing economics mm -hmm. and, and everything. And and so I left and, and went to the monastery as well. Like I, <laughs> and I grew up in a scientific foundation, the family orientation as well. And I always write about like a, feeling like this hole in my heart like what is something's missing like mm. I know all the numbers up here but something isn't working in here and you went to Harvard right for your undergrad was that you're in Boston right now um so actually I, I went to Emory University for my undergrad which I was in Atlanta um then after this time the spirit of my life in 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 Asia I came to Harvard to do a master um in education at, at Harvard and this was, uh, it was a program called Mind and Brain Education. And this, this, you know, my hope was to really now begin this, this fusion, this integration of East and West of science and spirituality of like, how can I take all these insights, um, you know, about the, the body and the mind from science and bring them together with a lot of the wisdom of these contemplative traditions, like in service of, of growth and learning and development. Um, so this whole time I was actually working as a teacher and, and I was, you know, I'm, I'm raised uh, you know, my, my father is a professor, you know, coming from background of sort of academics and educators. And so that's kind of sort of in my blood and something I love to do is to teach. Um, and then, you know, I, after I finished that program, then I, I kind of 
started my my own business of of working now and in, in what I do in this in this world of kind of health healing, holistic wellness, um, helping people you know reconnect their their head, their heart, and their body. And and you went through this process yourself. Like, what was one concept that you learned? Let's say at the mattress program, or just on your journey, whatever, wherever that helped you reconnect and and integrate. Mm, yeah. I mean, I think those are two key words right there, like reconnect, integrate, right? Like, like those are such huge principles that, that really, you know, underlie this, this work, right? It's like, first, we need to notice how we're disconnected, right? And, and we live in such like isolated, fragmented worlds, right? And, and even more so with COVID now, right? At, like at every level, like we're, we're, our worlds are so isolated, we're so cut off you know, from, from the food that we eat, we're cut off from, from people and communities. Like, um, and so I think this process of, of reconnecting, you know, again, like a lot of it goes back to that, that earlier time of having an eating disorder where it's like, I felt like, you know, there was these voices in my head saying, you know, you can't eat this or you can do that, or you deserve this or your body, you know, sucks like that. Right. And, um, and then learning to sort of, to, to, to lower the volume on those and then crank up the volume on what my body and my heart were telling. Right. And then there's a, you know, and this is where a lot of, uh, you know, Buddhist and other, you know, spiritual practices have so much to inform us, right. Cause they give us these technologies and these sort of like tools, right. For investigating mm. some more of the somatic and emotional, and we can put this in sort of scientific language, right? you know, you could, you could call it, you know, somatic tracking or like, you know, effective labeling or, you know, whatever you want. But like, you know, that's, it's, it's mindfulness of body. It's, it's mindfulness of, of heart and emotion. Right. Um, and so, so learning how to do that and then making it a practice, you know, and, and this can be done through obviously like seated meditation, but you know, there's so many ways to reconnect with your body, you know, through, through movement, through art, through journaling. Um, and so, just again, it kind of comes back to this, this really whole person perspective, right? And, and this was the part of me that really bothered me about education and has been spoken about by so many people that, you know, we educate people from here on up. It's very, it's very cerebral. It's very intellectual. Um, you know, we, we only value a certain type of cognitive intelligence, right? And we lose out on all these other aspects of intelligence. And, and to me, that's so silly, right? Because it's like you have this amazing source of wisdom and we're not accessing it we're not using it so and i know that's obviously with with your work yeah. and eating right it's like it's like yeah like how do we bring these on board right and so there's definitely that that pull right um to to try to, we try have to like and these voices up here that are all logical and whatever cultural but they're kind of just in the void disconnected from our our body when you first began to reconnect to your body what was, what were you doing specifically? Like, did you learn mm -hmm. meditation in the, uh, did you learn it somewhere or did you, were you more into art at, or like yeah. journaling and, and how did you first begin mm -hmm. to reconnect and, and, to, you know, I, I loved your phrase too, to turn down the volume of those voices and, you know, I think turn up the volume of the inner wisdom, the, the body sensations, the energy in your body. Right. Right. And I just want to, I want to make it really clear too, that it's like, it's not about like, you know, completely, you know, turning off the voices in your head, right. And only paying attention to the body, right. It's like, it's not an either or, right. This is a both end. And, and I think that's really critical mm. that we don't, we don't throw out the mind. Cause I think mm. that's the other is like, you can, there often is sort of this allergic reaction against the mind saying like, Oh, like all these ideas are toxic and horrible. And like, yeah, I to, can't like, think any thoughts. If I think right, any like, thoughts that I'm doing meditation wrong and, I suck at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so like what we've done there is you just swing the pendulum entirely the other way. Mm. And, um, and now you've lost all this stuff over here. Right. So like there's mm -hmm. value in both, there's mm. truth in both. And again, mm. this is where like the integration piece is really mm. hard. Um, Interesting. That's a great you point. Know? You're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, in terms of the, the practices, as you said, like I, I, I am so fortunate that I think, throughout many parts of my life, I was sort of introduced to, to kind of, again, this, this body intelligence and wisdom and awareness. It started with martial arts. It's something I started as like a six-year-old and continued throughout all of my childhood. So my, my sensei, my teacher is there. Um, I think instilled a lot of that into me. In the school I went to, I went to a Quaker high school. And I don't know how much you know about Quakerism, but like, you know, there's a 
you know, there's this it's idea like of meeting for a warship. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's very it's, much yeah, it. You know, yeah. it's like our entire high school would come together once a week for about an hour and we'd sit in silence. Like, you know, there wasn't a pastor, there wasn't a sermon, there wasn't an agenda. It was just quiet, contemplative time, both students and teachers, right? And this was like, you know, talk about like honoring the inner life of people. It's saying like, hey, we know there's a lot going on in your head and in your body. We're just going to give you some time to like sit with it, <laughs> you know? And obviously then, it, you know, there's that part too. If you feel moved to share something, you can stand up and share it. And it's just like holding the space to receive it. Mm. Um, mm. So that was another thing that I think planted the seed in me, um, you know, and then, yeah. And then later on in my life, you know, learning a lot more about Buddhist meditation and, and stuff you know, obviously gave me a whole nother sort of framework and, and toolkit to approach that. Mm, I think just being able to sit in silence for some time and to let the silence, right? Like we all, we're always busy doing things and sometimes just sitting there and like listening. It's, <laughs> it's what we need. <laughs> it's what it, we need. It, it, it is. I, I, yeah, just, just sit with it. You know, I mean, we all need to come back and and do our own work and, and learn how to, and learn how to be with ourselves, you know? And I think w one of the, the many reasons, right, the COVID lockdown was so hard is that like it forced people kind of to, to be with themselves in a little bit more of a direct way than yeah. perhaps they're used to, right? Because a lot of our normal distractions and busyness was taken away. And, yeah. um, you know, and there's, yeah, there's tremendous value, but it's, it's, it's really hard. Like if you've never been taught how to do it, it's really hard and and yeah. you know and, and i'm sure you know and it's especially if you you know there's something you talk about a lot like if, if you experience trauma and like we've all experienced some form of trauma but like especially you know really like physical things like tuning into your body sitting with your body sensations and feelings like can be extremely overwhelming and really difficult right it so is. like it only makes sense that we're gonna want to turn away you know, and, and now we have these, these devices, right. That like make it so freaking easy to do that, and you know, food, and it's like, and food. yeah, and exactly. Food, right? You know, it, yeah. Right, it, right. If there isn't food on them, it's like you use this to get your on-demand food. Right. <laughs> and then, and then, and then you're, 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 you're scrolling away at this while you're eating, you know, and, and, and it's completely disconnected. You know, it's like, are, are you hungry? Are you angry? Are you lonely? Are you tired? Right. Like what's, what's actually going on for you? Um, <sighs> yeah. And, and then that's what makes, you know, I, I think, this work that that we do you know for me it's so fascinating you know i love to help working with people to unravel these patterns in themselves right like uh you know mm -hmm. to gain that self-awareness to understand you know how they're sort of perpetuating a lot of these patterns of, of harm you know of, of, of the same it's like you yeah. know unhealthy mind body relationships absolutely it's so fascinating to me too how how immediate and accessible these quote unquote spiritual teachings are sometimes when I hear spirituality, I think there's connotations around the word like crystal balls and healing. <laughs> and, you know, it's very like new agey. And so mm -hmm, sometimes yeah. when you hear about spirituality impacting and, and integrating with eating disorders, it, I think sometimes people might be like, Oh, like pray my eating disorder away. But no, like, I love what you're talking about. It's like, this is the, the, the wisdom of your body, the, the wisdom of your body. There's so much I could talk about there. I'm struggling for words, but just like these simple things of listening to your body. And, and really, I know for me personally, struggling with anxiety, the ability to uh, calm myself down, I think is so important to, you know, as you mentioned that these feelings that come up in your body, they can be so overwhelming. Um, just sometimes even sitting with food can just be overwhelming for people. And, and, you know, sometimes people don't eat food because it just makes them feel so overwhelmed. It's the opposite of like binge eating or whatever. Uh, but like learning to feel the anxiety in your body and, and, a, and a deep breathe and to feel that, 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 uh, that stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm sharing, I'm sharing a breath with you. It feels so good. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> like that, that to me is spirituality. And it seems like mm. that's what, what a lot of what you learned too in these, uh, you know, your studies at Harvard and, and everything like that. Yeah. I mean, there's a, I like think a real rounded a, approach to, yeah, there's so much you said integration in, in, or, in that. And I, I want to pull out three things that think like are really salient to me. Like one, the fact that we're both men talking about this, I find is really interesting. Right. Yeah. And that, 
Yeah. Because this is the, you know, and, and I feel like we're going to need to have many more conversations to delve into, <laughs> you know, masculinity and patriarchy and paternalism and how that factors into to men and, and their relationship to their bodies and eating. And, but I think that it's rare to have this conversation among men, one, uh-huh. you know, um, two, yeah. the anxiety piece. Like, I definitely have anxiety issues and, and I can see the ways in which I've used food or I've used exercise as sort of coping mechanisms and um and you're right and like the, you know just like so much of mindfulness is just learning you know at the, at the basic level to like understand the sort of state of my nervous system yeah yeah and like and like how wound up am i and then just having some simple tools to again sort of like adjust that volume level like so i can function a little bit better right that's you know it's, it's so fundamental and none of these practices work if you don't feel safe first and so we need mm. to come back to restore that level of sort of safety and, and security initially. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the last piece, yeah, about spirituality, right? Like that's another big topic of discussion. And we often, mm-hmm. you know, now like there's this sort of like spiritual new agey identity, right? Which is like, I'm going to have my, you know, my, my crystals and my essential oils and, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and, you know, the, and, and, and all that stuff is cool, but it's like the problem is, again, we, I think this is a little bit of that same issue of like swinging the pendulum entirely the other way, where it's like, I'm going to, you know, reject anything that science has, yeah. has taught us about the world and kind of go way off into left field. Um, and they're not really communicating with each other, right? So it's like the spirituality for me is, is about wholeness, you know, and, and, a, and a spiritual practice is a practice of awakening to, to wholeness. You know, and, and, and that takes shapes in, in you know, it, it, there's so many forms of that at, at every single level, um, you know. And what's interesting is, you know, recently, like if you go look on my, my website and on my blog, you know, there's a lot of things I normally write about, like, like nutrition and physical performance and mindfulness. But recently I added another category called spiritual activism. And, and I felt like this, this was me, like I needed another bucket to talk about some of these things that I was feeling really drawn to that, that, you know, I sort of noticed for many years. And I think in, in my work, there's been this natural evolution, you know, it's like I started as, as kind of like, you know, personal trainer and group exercise instructor. And then I had this sort of parallel track as like an educator and teacher, um, you know, but, but like so much of this work remains like very superficial, perhaps very narcissistic, right? Very vain. Um, you know, and, and, and so there's this shift from it's like, you know, doing this work because like I care about, you know, how I look and how I feel and how I perform, which, which are important, but like also now evolving that is like, well, how do we look? <laughs> how do uh, we feel? Uh, how do, how are we performing? How are, right? And then performing might not be the road, but it's like, how are we all collaborating in this thing called life together, right? So it's like expanding that scope out beyond the individual to the collective. And, and to me, that's, mm. again, sort of where, where the spiritual naturally leads us is this acknowledgement that we are part of a greater whole. Like we're a whole into ourselves, but we're also part of this greater whole. And we Absolutely. need to understand that relationship and how we, you know, our own personal wholeness supports the wholeness of, of the greater, but there's also things that we can do there. Um, and so obviously, you know, a lot of this stuff going on in the is world. This like, if we, when you talk about activism, is this, how, how is spiritual activism different than regular spirituality <laughs> or what, what's like the kind of unique, like energy flow to it? You know, what yeah. I hear you saying right now is like spirituality naturally leads to, I hear, I, I didn't understand the difference between spiritual activism and spirituality. Yeah, sure. Um, and I do think there sort of is this natural yeah, yeah, confluence, a, right? Uh-huh, like uh-huh. I think, um, I guess the activism part just ensures that the spiritual doesn't get lost in the sort of like individual egotistical narcissism, which, which it, which it can, right? Like if you look uh, around at like uh, spiritual communities, right. That like, huh. you know, maybe there, maybe at one level, there is this appreciation for the greater whole of like, hmm. you know, like the, un, you know, the, the ecosystem and, and understanding human relationships in nature. And, and there's very much this, uh, you know, drive towards compassion and love and care. Um, however, there can at be a the close level of mindedness. Yeah. Sort of. Yeah. Well, back, back, there can definitely be that. Right. And then, and then when you actually like really examine people's behavior, you know, there still can be a lot of individual egoism involved. Right. And, sure. and there can be a lot of, um, you know, like it's, it's, 
it's so hard because that that egoism and especially like within like our current modern American culture, like we're raised in such yeah, right. right? Like an invidious in, in, what's the right word? Individualistic culture, right? And materialistic culture, right? So like these poles are always gonna be pulling us back in this way, mm-hmm. right? Um and it's so hard to break free from that that frame of reference and of mind. And so I guess the activism piece, you know, it's like I think of these three buckets, right? We have our inner work, which is the, the work we do on ourselves, right? And that could be, again, the mindfulness or journaling and other things. And then we, we have sort of interpersonal work, which just happens at the level of conversations with others. And then we have outer work. But this is the work at the level of, of systems, of institutions, of policies, right? And I think the drive right now that we're seeing for, for social justice, right, is like this tremendous outcrying for outer work. Like we need to, we need to really re, like reshape, right? If not completely blow up and rebuild like a lot of systems in the environment that we're living in, right? And so I think the activism part just says like, keep going. Like don't just do your inner work. Don't just do your interpersonal work. We also need work at the level of systems. I see. And that's actually a really big part of the, 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 the third wheel of uh, Dharma, as they say, in the, in the Buddhist tradition. From what I, you know, so Buddhism came from the East and now it's moving to the West. And as it reshapes itself in the West, it, you know, in the, in the India, they had monks who traditionally would, would leave home and, and kind of uh, seclude themselves from family and friends. And, and, you know, the West is doing things differently. We're learning to integrate these powerful spiritual principles that help us reconnect to our body and breath while we have jobs and interact. And a big part of this shift is, is, you know, social justice. It's uh, dealing with systems. So I, I really um, hear what, where you're coming from in terms of that. Um, I kind of want to, acknowledge your, your, your drive. And, and I, I'm excited to see where your journey is going to take you. Um, I really feel that you're coming from a place of, uh, of being healed yourself. There's this quote where those who can heal have been healed themselves or, or have been wounded themselves. And, and I, I feel that, and it's a real gift that I, I feel that you're able to, um, to bring this type of presence and, and, uh, understand what people are going through at a deeper level. And, um, and, and that and and the drive for spiritual activism. I think that's a unique combination. Me and you are both young guys. I think that's also another fascinating conversation that um, here we are two guys talking about this. Mm-hmm. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, I think just wrapping up, I think uh, awesome. it's cool to hear about your journey and where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, yeah, I mean, I, thank you so much, man. And, and thank you for saying that. And I would yeah. say that I am, I am healing. Right. And, yeah. And, yeah. Right. And we same, all are. And, and like same, we all same, are evolving. Same, same. And yes, I think I've, I've, I've done, a, I've done a lot of work, but I know there's so much more to, to do and to be done. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and this is sort of, again, that, that drive for more of a little bit of that spiritual activism. It's like, you know, once you've done a lot of the work on yourself individually, like now it's like, we got to really take an honest look at, at the systems we're part of and how are, how our lives and, you know, how our own personal power is contributing or, or not to the greater good. Um, yeah. You know, and, and it's like, we need both, you know, we, we need, do. we need, we need both of those things in, in action. Right. And, and I so, think like sometimes just <laughs> riffing a little bit before we wrap up, but uh, the Dalai Lama said like a beautiful concept that sounds paradoxical at first, but the idea of a uh, selfish selflessness, I, I <laughs> think that humans are, we're naturally, you know, self-centered, but that there's a, a way to, to, uh, kind of approach this selflessness where you're not getting burned out, where you're not, uh, giving too much and just like not giving to yourself. Um, anyways, conversation for another time, hopefully. Thanks for your time. So many conversations for another time. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, it's been a pleasure and, uh, yeah, we'll chat again. Okay.